Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The name Isaiah means the salvation of our Lord. And many people look at this prophecy of Isaiah and feel that over and over God speaks of salvation. And it's true that there are numerous prophecies of God delivering and saving his people. Obviously, within the book of Isaiah, there are many messianic prophecies. But we need to also understand, and we'll see this not just today, but next week, in fact, for the next several weeks and a few months, we are going to be focusing in on God's judgment. And we're going to see that God's judgment, it is going to, for the most part, affect those nations around Israel. Israel itself will also experience judgment. But when we read all of Isaiah, we see that in the last days, God will indeed move in a unique way based upon who he is and the promises that he has made and the covenant that he has established. And he will move in faithfulness to that covenant to bring about, and here's the key, a great day of salvation for the sons and the daughters of Jacob, in other words, for the Jewish people. But what we're going to be looking at today, next week, and for the next few months is various expressions of God's judgment. And most scholars agree that this judgment, we should understand it as a dual fulfillment. We're going to see that there are clear references within this series of judgments of God relating to the last days, but as well, there's going to be judgment in the days of Isaiah the prophet. So we see that there is a dual fulfillment. But today, when we look at our chapter, and we're going to be in chapter 13, I would invite you to open up your Bibles and turn there. We're really going to see within this chapter, there are numerous references and hints within the text that, that by and large, this is talking about a last day fulfillment. And this is important because it's going to help us and lay the foundation for us being better able to discern those clues that later on we will encounter in other prophecies that once again gives us the information, the lens to properly see the text and what period it is alluding to. And for the most part, these clues are clues for the last days. Look with me to verse 1. The book of Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 1. The first word here is the word Massah, which is a, a burden. It is a judgment place upon a people. It is a proclamation that will be carried out with action. And here we see it's the burden of Babylon. Babylon is going to take Judah, that southern empire, for the most part here. We're emphasizing Babylon as those who took Judah, that southern kingdom, captive into exile for 70 years. But both Isaiah and the prophet Jeremiah in very clear terms informs us that Nebuchadnezzar, 
the Babylonians, they were not acting in obedience. They were acting according to their sinful nature. God, he used that as a instrument of his judgment because he was displeased with Judah. The lack of justice and righteousness within that nation, the corruption of the leadership, and the idolatry that was taking place both in Jerusalem and throughout Judah. So God used it. It's as though that he brought them, but they were acting in their own disobedience, and therefore, because they were not truly willful servants of God, God brought upon them, and this is what we're seeing, his judgment. Realize that in the book of Revelation, Babylon is used symbolically for a, a empire that wants to take captive God's people in disagreement with the purposes of God, in conflict with the will of God. And Babylon, and I say it's used symbolically to speak about that, that nation, that empire in the last days that God will destroy. And we see a foretaste of that in chapter 13 of our study of Isaiah. And we see, as I said, that it has, when we look at the clues of the text, this is speaking about a judgment day that has significant implications to the end times as well. Once more, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amotz, he received a vision. Now, the word here for receiving a vision is the word chaza. Chaza, we get the noun chazon. Chazon is a vision, a revelation. But this is in the verbal construction, and in English we really don't have a verb for a vision. We have to say seeing a vision. So Isaiah, everything that we're reading, he saw in a vision. And as I say, this vision, when we look at the language of chapter 13, in my opinion, it sheds more light on the future, the last days, than it really does in speaking literally about what happened to the Babylonian Empire. When I'm speaking about after the captivity, those seven years of captivity ended and God brought judgment upon them. Verse 2. Upon a mountain, and many Bibles and will say in verse 2, a high mountain, and that's probably correct because the literal word here is a bare mountain, one that is, is cleared away. And so a mountain that, that has no trees on it or anything is usually because of high altitude. Now, altitude or a mountain that is high up is speaking about a government, a very strong government. And it's teaching us that indeed Babylon was just that. It was a powerful empire. But God is going to bring change. Upon a, a bare mountain, he says, lift up a banner. This is the Hebrew word. And even if you're not highly interested in learning Hebrew, there are certain words that need to be part of your vocabulary because they repeat so frequently and they have great significance. This is the word nes. Nes, if you would just say that in, in modern Hebrew and ask someone, what does that mean in English? They would tell you it's a word that relates to that which is miraculous, a miracle. But it also can be a banner or a pole a pole which held a banner, and there's a degree of proclamation. Many times this word is used for a victorious army that is returning in victory and proclaiming over those who have, they have taken captive that they have defeated. They are proclaiming their victory. 
This word should always cause one to pay attention. So lift up a banner, and then he uses a synonym for that same idea of lifting up, raising up a voice to them. Who's them? The Babylonians. Lift up a voice to them and wave your, your hand. And it says, and bring, and this is probably bringing this banner, this proclamation, these, these defeated individuals, bring them to the gates. And notice the next word, nidivim. Nidivim has to do with someone who, in a literal sense, is generous or volunteering. But in this case, it's speaking about those of of a noble quality, obviously. Noble usually implies wealthiness so that they could have time to volunteer or have time or resources to make donations. So it speaks about this proclamation of, of, of victory, of the defeat of the enemy as they're being marched through this, this gate or gates that were reserved for the, the noblemen. Verse 3. I, and this I, is relating to God. I have commanded. And then we have some interesting phrases. We have the word, mekudashai. Mekudashai are the sanctified ones. And here, it's related to the word holy, but we need to realize, and I say frequently, that holiness is related to purpose. And these are individuals who have been set apart for the purposes of God. And what is this purpose? Well, I commanded my sanctified ones. Also, I have called to my mighty ones for my anger. So these are, and it's probably a reference to his heavenly host, his heavenly armies, that they are going to, to execute God's anger. And he says he's going to do that. And these are the ones, Alize Gabati, those who rejoice in my, my majesty. So those who are praising God, and here again, this is why we have this idea of a heavenly host. They're praising God, rejoicing at God and His majesty. But these are the very ones that are going to be used that have been set apart in order to execute God's judgment upon the world. Verse 4. Now, we've already seen that this judgment, it is it's not so much a judgment that is going to come through human means as we're talking, and we'll see other hints and clues to this, that we're talking about a heavenly judgment in a supernatural expression. Verse 4. The sound or the voice, the word kol, and it's with a kuf and not kaf. If it was with a kaf, it would be all, but this is a kuf, so it's the voice. The voice of Hamon, a multitude. Many people. The voice of many upon the mountains. And the mountains has to do with other government authorities. So this judgment is primarily upon Babylon. That's what we're told in verse 1. But it has implications for not just the Babylonian empire, but other empires, other seats of government. And it's similar, it's like Amrav. Now, we're seeing here parallelism. So this is poetic. It's prophecy. Frequently, prophecy is poetic. But when you look here, it's similar to this, this multitude, it's similar to an abundant people. And once more, it's a voice, kol sha'on. Sha'on is a, a large sound, a great noise. And then we have in parallelism to the mountains, which I said symbolically, prophetically, oftentimes relate to empires. Notice it has mamlachot goyim, 
the kingdoms of the nations. And they are being assembled. Now, they are not assembling themselves, but God, the implication is, God is bringing them. And notice as this fourth verse ends, the Lord of hosts, he's commanding an army for war. So this is bringing what we're seeing here is something that has implications beyond Babylon. Now, some would say that God is bringing the nations to judge Babylon. And we know that the Medes and the Persians, and in a moment we'll come across the Medes, that puts it as a hint for the time, or shortly thereafter, Isaiah. So it has that, that implication to it. But realize something. Realize that there's going to be more, and we'll see this in a moment, more references, more hints to the last days. So Isaiah he prophesied in the 8th century. Babylon took the Jewish people captive in the 6th century. And their judgment was, as we know, around 70 years later so at the early, early 6th century. So this is when I say Isaiah's day, I'm talking about a, a wider time period than just his life, but in the past, not something in the future is what my, my intent is when I speak of Isaiah's days. Look now to, to verse 5. It says, These, This judgment and the armies, they are coming from a distant land, from the ends of the heavens. So here again, another reference to not simply a natural judgment, through other armies and other peoples, but from the ends of the heavens. And the Lord, the Lord is and his vessels of his wrath, the Lord and the vessels of his wrath in order to, and this is the word, lechabel, lechabel, we have in the noun form, this is a infinitive, but in the noun form, we have the word mechablim, which are terrorists. Mechabel, one terrorist. This is the infinitive to cause terrorism, to bring about destruction or harm. And this word is used in the Hebrew New Testament for the announcing of God's wrath in the last days. In the book of Revelation chapter 7, now I'm aware that that is originally written in Greek, but, but the, the scholars chose this word in translating a Greek word into Hebrew for, the, we, for, for us to know that we're talking about a divine retribution. So look again, coming from a, a distant land, from the ends of heaven, the Lord and the vessels, the instruments of his wrath to cause harm upon all the earth. Now, this is a word land, sometimes land arts can be, be land or earth, but most of the translators and most of the scholars who interpret see this as having to do with a broader, not just one land, but upon the earth. Verse 6. They shall howl. Now, this is a word for lamenting. It is a word of expressing great, great sorrow and oftentimes great pain as well. And it has an a idea of a commandment that God is acting in order that they express this, this pain, this sorrow. And what is the source of this sorrow and pain? Well, it tells us, and here's one of the clearest, clearest uh, textual evidence that we're speaking about a reference to the last day because it says, Ki karov yom Hashem. The day of the Lord is near as the destruction from, and you probably know this word, Shaddai. We all know that popular song, El Shaddai. El meaning God, 
Shaddai, that is enough, that is sufficient. Usually referenced in English as almighty. It's a term that reveals a mighty God. So once more, God is bringing this. It's the day of the Lord according to verse 6. So it's the destruction from the Almighty One, the God who is sufficient. This is what's coming, verse 7. Therefore, every hand will let go. Now, what this is speaking of is this. When God's judgment falls, we can't hold on to anything. It is going to bring a change. See, people cling to sin. They cling to what they want. And it's related to their rebelliousness, but when God's judgment comes, they, they give up. They, they are defeated. So the hands, look again at verse, verse 7. Therefore, every hand, all the hands, they will let go. And every heart of man, every human heart would be a better way to translate it, will melt. And here again, this word for melt, it's used so frequently, for example, in the prophecy of Zechariah. It's used there and elsewhere in regard to the hearts melting, people melting, being dissolved because of the, the heat of God's anger. Now, all of this speaks, what we're seeing in the last few verses when we've encountered that phrase, the day of the Lord, we are encountering without any doubt that which is supernatural. I want to uh, uh, caution all of us because there is such scandalous false teaching. There's an individual that he wants to look at Revelation chapter 8 and that's that, that star that is coming that God is going to cast to the earth that is called worm wood. It is something that God is going to do supernaturally. And this, this worm wood is going to be a judgment upon the waters. Now, if, as he says, oh, we're looking at an asteroid, it is going to cause great death. Well, an asteroid might do just that. But this is not speaking about a natural phenomena. It is speaking about a supernatural one, and the results of it cannot be explained from a human perspective. What God does in Revelation chapter 8 and 9, what He does in Revelation 16, when we're talking about those trumpet judgments and bold judgments, they are supernatural. They do not have any physical, scientific explanation. It's not something, as, as this gentleman says, and he's, he's solely misguided, that people, scientists, are watching it now, and they've even projected a date of Friday the 13th in the year 2029. This is not at all related to Revelation 8. See, what God's going to do is that God's going to just simply speak. And this, this star, as it's called in, in the text, it's speaking about that which, and the reason why star is used is because that word oftentimes speaks of uh, revelation or illumination. The stars, if you go back, for example, to the book of Genesis in chapter 1, on the fourth day, he created the stars, the sun, the moon. And he says these are for signs and seasons. They are for illumination and revelation to, to establish things. This is not speaking about a meteor. So it is very dangerous when we try to explain that which is natural with the supernatural, or that which is supernatural with the natural. We need discernment. Verse 8. 
these individuals. Now, remember, it's a judgment on Babylon, but there's a greater, if it's a last day's context, there's a greater application to it, and it says, ve nivhalu. Nivhal, that is a word of, of fear, of great, it's, it's being startled by something. And when something startles you, I mean, you, you jump, you may even uh, uh, speak something, and your whole body converse, uh, contorts because of this. And this is a word of great fear. They will fear, and the fear is likened to serene, which are birth pains, and they use another word for, for extreme pain. It's that same word that we talked about earlier in a different form, but it's having to do with, with being a recipient of great harm and suffering. And it says these pains and these hurts will seize, and they will seize them as a woman who gives birth, as, as a, a one that suffers, a man based upon this, a man to his neighbor, meaning everyone. There'll be no exceptions. They will be amazed, shocked by this. And the faces of individuals will be a faith, face of a flame. Now, what's that, a fa face of a flame? Well, if, if a person is being consumed with flames, you can imagine the expression on their faith, face. One of great pain and terror, both from a physical and from an emotional standpoint. This is what God is describing. And I believe there's many references here for a last day interpretation as a predominant interpretation. Verse 9. Behold, once again, it says, behold, that means pay attention. Recognize what's being written immediately thereafter has great significance. Behold, the day of the Lord comes. It is, sorry, it is barbaric or cruel. And it's a, an expression of, it says, wrath and anger that, that will be placed upon the earth for destruction and the sinners of the earth or the sins of the earth, he will destroy from it, meaning from the world, the sinners will, will be no more. They are going to be removed from it. And here again, all of this is, is very, very reminiscent of what God's going to do in the last days. Verse 10. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations, they will, will not give forth their light. The sun, when it goes forth, it speaks about it will, will have darkness. And the moon will not uh, bring forth its light. So we have three ex expressions of darkness that is coming upon this world. Now, these things are things that we see in other prophecies. In fact, Messiah himself took these in very, very similar, if not exact terms, and he applied them to the last days. So even if this prophecy, and there's a hint to an earlier time, from our standpoint, a past expression upon Babylon, in the, the 6th century, but realize its, its main application is for the last days. Verse 11. Verse 11, here again, there's a word that you need to know. It's the word pakad. Pakad has many different uh, ways it's translated in the scripture. It can mean to to deposit something, to place something. In modern Hebrew, hafkadati, meaning I deposit it like a check in my bank account. But it can also be a word for, for redeeming or a word for vengeance and punishment. 
It's a word of God in a very mighty way, visiting. Visiting for a purpose. And the purpose can, can vary. I mentioned it can be a visitation for redeeming. It can be a visitation for destroying. What it tells us is this. The best way that, that I know how to, to relate this word is that it's God acting in a way that he's all in. He is going to behave in a most definite, most precise, and for a specific purpose. But that purpose can vary. Here, it's very clear. When we look at verse 11, he says, And I will visit upon the world evil. And it means it's evil. And upon wicked ones, their sins. So he, he is judging. He, it's a description of retribution. And he says, I will cause to cease the pride of the Zadim. Now, the term Zadim, a very common Hebrew word is the word Mazid. Mazid is, there's two words, and we encounter this in the Torah, the word Bishkaga, Bishkaga is a, a sin that's unintentional. It can be used for, for simply an a accident as well. Meaning, for example, if I uh, bumped into someone, Sitiadze, Bishkaga, I did this, but unintentionally. It was an accident. So you can use the word Bishkaga or Bali Kavana without any intent. But when we look at this word Mazid, Sitiadze be Mazid, I did this with intention. It means I understood what I was doing, I gave consideration to the implications, and I cast those away, and I did it anyway, even though I knew it was a wrong thing to do from, from society's standpoint from a governmental standpoint, from a divine, from a biblical standpoint. And God says he's going to visit, and this is with his judgment, those who with the pride of, of intentional sin, this is what he's speaking about. He is going to visit that and the pride of the, the Aretzim would be the tyrants, for example, he says, I will humble them. I will bring them low. So notice the fact that it's in the plural means it goes beyond one nation. Another hint to a last day uh, implication. Verse 12, the word okir. This is probably from the word yukra, which is luxurious or precious or rare. So here we have. I will make rare because it's in the hifel, the causative. So I'm going to make precious. Something's precious because there's not a lot of it. So, so I will make rare humanity as, as gold. Meaning gold is not something just fine like dirt. It's rare. And God says because of this judgment, humanity. It's not going to be full the earth is going to be highly populated when god's judgment remember when we look at the book of revelation there's judgments where like this a third of humanity dies so god is speaking about this in very clear terms i will make rare humanity as gold and man and it uses a different word from gold the gold of ophir so once more, Ophir, according to the commentators, had a very fine and rare gold, a precious gold. Therefore, look at verse 13, therefore the heavens, they will, will shake. And this word shake can also be the word for being angry. Margizoti. If I say, ata margizoti, you make me angry. And this is what this word is speaking. Therefore the heavens... Uh, will, will, will be angry and the earth is going to shake from its place. 
Why? When the wrath of the Lord of hosts, because of the wrath of the Lord of hosts, in the day of his, his fierce anger. And the fact that this phrase, the day, as in the day of the Lord, that term, the day, is also a reference to the end times. Verse 14. And it shall come about that the, the deer will be driven. Now, when something is, is frightful, for example, if there's a deer and something happens, that deer bolts, drives away, and he does that because he sees something that, that scares him, that frightens him. And this is the imagery that we're seeing here. For it shall come about as a deer is driven, as sheep, there is no one to gather, so there's no shepherd. And this speaks, if sheep have no shepherd, they are vulnerable. There's no defense, and that's what he's saying. There's no defense when God's judgment comes. Each man will turn to his people, and a man to his own land will flee. So the image here, in my opinion, is that you have nations going up for battle. We saw that earlier on when we looked at verse 4. And now they're returning from battle, not successfully, but fearfully. Having been defeated here, just the, just the scene of God's judgment coming causes them to fear and change. Now let's press on to verse Verse 15, all the ones who are found, they will be, or he will be, everyone that's found will be pierced, stabbed. And all the ones who are captured, they will fall, literally it's individually, everyone will fall by the sword. And their children, this is a word for a very young child, they will be crushed or torn into pieces. Some will say dash into pieces before their eyes. And their houses will be plundered. And their wives will be, will be humiliated, ravished. Verse 17. Behold, I am stirring up upon them. And then we have clearly the only reference to the time of Isaiah. And when I say the time once more of Isaiah, I'm speaking about back in the, the 6th and perhaps early 5th or late 5th century. We're talking about the time of the Babylonian judgment after the destruction of Jerusalem, the Babylonian captivity. So Isaiah prophesied this, but he wasn't alive for it in that sense. Verse 17, Behold, I, this is God speaking, Behold, I am stirring up upon them Madai. Those are the Medes. And concerning them, notice, they want wrath. They want bloodshed. They're not there to plunder because it says, Who money or silver they will not consider, and gold they will not desire it. They don't want they're not coming to plunder. They can't be bribed not to destroy the people. They're coming for one purpose, and that is destruction, human destruction. Verse 18. Now, in my opinion, verse 18 in this passage is one of the most difficult ones because the grammar is confusing. We have bows. Bows of perhaps the young men they are going to be destroyed. But the problem is that, that we have a feminine, and it's not passive, so it's hard to, to render this, but I'm just going to go with what others do in this and say, the bows of young men, they will be destroyed. And the fruit, the fruit of the womb, uh, he, they will not have mercy for concerning the sons, they will not have compassion. Their eyes will not have compassion. 
So again, very barbaric, very cruel, just one purpose, and that is to, to place pain and suffering and death upon, upon this evil empire. Verse 19. And it shall come about Babylon as the beauty, beautiful one of the nations, the splendor and the majest, majesty of the Chaldeans. It says, as the overturning by God of Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon should be. Now, what's important about that is how Sodom and Gomorrah were, were defeated, overturned, not through human means. Fire came down and brought about this destruction. So this is, again, another reference to something that is not human or natural or can be explained scientifically. This is the wrath of God. Verse 20. We have that... that it will never be settled again, nor will there be any more dwellers from generation to generation. So this is speaking about something that, that we cannot place in the time of the, the Medes and the Persians' defeat of Babylon. Because Babylon was re-inhabited. People live there now. What this verse is saying, look at verse 20. Lo teshev lenitzah. It will never be settled forever. And no one will dwell unto generation until generation. And we have here, no one will pitch a tent there. And it means not no one, but an RV, an Arab, will not pitch a tent there. And that's literally what it says. An Arab will not pinch a, pitch a tent there, and, and shepherds will not cause their flock to lie down there. So there's that, that expression of eternal judgment. That does not fit the time frame of the Medes and the Persians, but an eternal judgment is what this verse has. Verse 21. Verses 21 and 22 speaks as well of a eternal judgment and notice what it says but shall lay down there and we have a word of some type of desert animal its word sayim but we don't know with assurance what that is and we also have another definition of a a desert animal called ochim they will fill their homes so there's no human inhabited animals come and, and take over. And we've seen something that really confirms that. As this is being recorded, we're, we're living in the coronavirus times. And when nations were kind of uh, locked down, people didn't go out as much. Things were very, very still. What happened? Animals started to come in to the city. Now, this is what it's saying. Because there's not going to be any human life, animals are going to inhabit these places. We read, also shall dwell there ostriches and, and goats will dance. They will be happy with the, the destruction of these evil humans in that location. Verse 22, our last verse. We read here, ve'ana. Now, there's a word, ona, which is a season, like fall, winter, spring, summer. But this is an abbreviated form of that, according to Rashi and the other commentators I, I consulted. This word can also mean to respond or answer or to afflict, but parallelism demands that we see it related to the word ona and not the verb for a response. So her time, at this time for this evil empire, it says, once again, another word for a desert type of animal. It says these desert type of animals will be in 
his palaces in the luxurious buildings at that time. And then it says, and jackals, this word we do know, jackals will be in their, their sanctuaries of delight. For the time is close to coming. And her days will not, they will not uh, continue, meaning that the time for this is not going to delay and be drawn out, but rather when God says, now it's going to happen, there'll be no hesitation, and his judgment will fall. Well, we briefly looked at chapter 13, a chapter that begins a long list of different locations, in the Middle East that will experience God's consuming judgment. Israel as well will be a recipient, but when we look, we're going to see that this judgment for Israel is going to have a different outcome. And that's where the significance, the wisdom is. We need to ask why that is. And the reason is that God's going to remember the patriarchs, their faithfulness, the covenant that they entered into, and God is, although he's going to judge Israel, there is going to be a remnant that he will keep covenant that his faithfulness will be placed upon them and that they are going to come to faith and that same gospel with that same expectation of Messiah and that they're going to behold the true Messiah and they're going to receive him in that last moment. That's what we'll clearly see as we continue on through the book of Isaiah. I'll stop with that. Until next time, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.